folks are still trickling in, but we'll get started. Um, try and stay inside the time today. <laughs> so uh, my name is Naomi. I'm one of the leadership fellows for the data science track that is hosting this webinar today for Women Who Code. I'm going to share my screen. As soon as it allows me to. <laughs> So today you have found yourself in the machine learning for social good workshop series with Keisha Williams. This is the second workshop and she also had a, a talk in connect digital before that. If you want to find any of um, those previous videos, you can go to women Code's YouTube channel and you'll be able to find them there. There will also be a recording of this workshop uh, within a week after it happening here live if you want to review anything. Uh, today we have myself and Sapphire. Um, we're both uh, fellowship leads for data science and blockchain. Did you want to say hello, Sapphire? Hey everyone. Um, it's really good to be here today and I'm super excited to kick off workshop two with Keisha and the team. And if you want to reach out to me, there's my email address there as well. Yeah, so Sapphire and I will be in the chat and um, grabbing the Q&A to give to Kesha by the end of the webinar. We also have um, a Slack channel specifically for this workshop series, which Sapphire has already posted in the chat. We'll post that again later as we go through. Feel free to reach out to either of us directly. Um, you've got both of our emails here. Mine is Naomi at womenwhocode.com. There are also lots of other track leads um for our track so these are some other folks supporting data science um they're all super helpful you'll see them in the slack channel please feel free to reach out and connect with any of them uh, here at women who code our mission is inspiring women to excel in technology careers and our vision is a world where women are representative as technical executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. Anywhere you find folks in tech, we hope women are there. Um, we have 230,000 members worldwide across a variety of networks in over 20 countries. Um, along with the webinars, we also provide access to uh, job boards and other resources that you can find on womenwhocode.com. And our movement, especially now in uh, these strange and unprecedented times with the pandemic and other world events, um, as the world changes, we at Women Who Code can be a connecting force that creates a sense of belonging while the world is being asked to isolate. And so for sure, you can listen in on the workshop today, but we really do hope you'll connect with each other in the chat. We hope you'll find each other in Slack. Kesha will be in the Slack for the uh, workshop channel as well. We do have a code of conduct here. Um, we're an inclusive community and um, our events are intended to inspire women and we don't tolerate harassment of members in any form. Um, you can find the whole uh, code of conduct at womenwhocode.com slash code of conduct. This is also where our incident report form is. So if you know, you're know you feeling uncomfortable with anything, please feel free to um, submit information there. Along with data science and blockchain, we do have a variety of other track communities where you can go and find uh, webinars, support other Slack channels in a variety of areas, mobile, Python, front end, all those sorts of things. <laughs> I've told you a couple of times to join our track. I hope you do join us there. Um, you can also get involved at a higher level and volunteer, so feel free to reach out about contributing. We always want to thank our amazing sponsors for making these events possible. And now we'll get into the workshop. You'll see that there are a couple other folks with us here today. Um, so Kesha will introduce them as well, but most of the workshop will be with her today. So I'll let you kick it off from here, Kesha. Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. 
we're starting out with a very special treat. I have two engineers from AWS and they are going to share with us how they are using machine learning in the real world to battle COVID-19. So I'm super excited and happy to have them here with us today. So Colby and uh, George, I will kick it over to you to introduce yourselves and tell us more about how you're using machine learning. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Kendra. We're super excited to be here. Uh, so I'm Colby. I am a data scientist and manager in the machine learning solutions lab at AWS. We basically focus on accelerating the adoption of machine learning for enterprises and businesses uh, around novel and interesting use cases. Uh, I'll let George introduce himself. Yeah. And hi, I'm George Price and I'm a deep learning architect in the machine learning solutions lab at AWS. And I do the same thing as Copy. We help customers set up machine learning solutions. Awesome. So really what we'd like to talk to you about is, is one of the many uh, initiatives at AWS, uh, one in particular that is close to us that we've worked on and kind of helped spearhead that is around using uh, scientific literature in research that has been published and is being published uh, almost daily on COVID-19 you know, so this is data covering whether it be treatments, vaccines, um, publications, you kind of name it. And basically how we use this data set to construct a search engine that basically leverages machine learning to help artificial intelligence researchers and policymakers find answers to key questions around COVID-19. So a little bit of background on kind of the data set. You know, we're all data scientists. I imagine we're always interested in where we got the data and what kind of data it is. So this data was actually available via Kaggle. And it was a collaboration with a number of different, uh, you know, organizations, the Allen Institute for, for AI, uh, you know, Georgetown, the White House, you kind of name it. But basically what they're able to do is bring together just large volumes of research uh, that was literally being published as the pandemic was evolving and has been evolving and make it available to the wider kind of data science community, you know, us and you guys. And essentially what they did is as part of the Kaggle challenge is pose a number of specific questions that they were trying to solve or trying to get insights into using this data. And so from our perspective, we thought this would be an interesting way to kind of showcase how machine learning can be used to help address some of these questions, help get insights from this data set, uh, realizing that essentially, you know, a researcher looking through hundreds of thousands of articles is really, really difficult. Uh, and George, do you want to kind of? Yeah, so, so the solution that we came up with is essentially a combination of machine learning powered search engine and a machine learning powered knowledge graph. So we'll go over what the uh, complete solution looks like in a minute, but here's just a, a quick insight into what sort of a knowledge graph looks like, and here's a tool for visualizing it. Um, so what you have, as Colby mentioned, the data set is essentially made up of uh, research publications. And so what we did is we used machine learning to kind of extract um, relevant concepts from all of these papers and use that to create this knowledge graph that kind of connects the papers together. So you can see here, you know, the, the graph is fairly huge and I'm not sure how easy this is to see, but basically you have a bunch of nodes, these little blue nodes, these are the papers in the data set, the publications. And then these red nodes, these are the concepts that we've extracted. So for example, you have this concept here and this one is called pulmonary infections. And all of these edges coming off of it, these connect to all the papers that contain something to do with pulmonary infections. Um, and so using a couple of techniques that we'll get into in a minute, we constructed this knowledge graph and we've used that um, along with Amazon Kendra to create what we call the Cord Explorer. And so this is a publicly available website and here uh, researchers can basically ask questions. You can ask natural language questions. What do we know about COVID-19 risk factors? Um, and it will give you a sort of an intelligently ranked list of papers based on how relevant they are to the question that you asked. And so, you know, underneath the hood, really, you know, what Amazon Kendra is doing uh, in combination with the, you know, COVID-19 knowledge graph 
is essentially looking at the, you know, using natural language processing and actually analyzing thousands of documents in real time and basically saying, you know, which documents are most related or most relevantly talking about, you know, in this case, as, as George is typing in, symptoms of COVID-19, right? And so this is actually going above and deeper than traditional, you know, search engines that generally use like keyword search to look at specific words and, and look at uh, uh, document tagging. You know, this is actually adding a whole other level of intelligence to that search process. Uh, and so this is really kind of giving you enterprise level natural language search. Uh, the COVID-19 knowledge graph as George kind of depict is basically allowing you to see you know, both, you know, the articles, once you have search results, but actually see how all these articles are connected across the entire data set. Uh, the second thing we're actually doing as well as George, when he clicks on an article here, is you're taken to a page that demonstrates more information on the publication. So you have the abstract, you have the title, you have the publication date, uh, you also have citations. And so this comes directly from the COVID-19 knowledge graph, where we're essentially seeing you know, when papers or research articles are written, it's common to, you know, traditional to always cite your sources, right? It's extremely important to be able to trace back where you're getting that, that information, that knowledge, that evidence that you're using to make your argument. And we actually can leverage those citations to help you search and find additional relevant articles as well. Um, on the right-hand panel, what you're actually seeing, and, and this is kind of titled similar papers, what you're actually seeing here is essentially showing you uh, what we're doing here is basically using uh, the knowledge graph and actually the semantic information from articles to rank which ones or which articles out of thousands are most similar to the one you clicked on, right? So, you know, you find a great article, and you're like, this is, this is exactly relevant to what I'm looking for. You know, what else is, is extremely relevant uh, about this exact article or, or most similar to this exact article that I'm reading? And so this is kind of what we call a recommendation engine that uses similarity ranking, essentially, uh, driven by machine learning. And so, you know, to kind of give you a little bit of background on kind of what, you know, how this is being used, you know, this is currently being used for, you know, a large majority of countries uh, in the world. We've actually seen uh, since inception, uh, which was in April, we've seen millions of queries being run on this system. Uh, a number of different questions, um, you know, it basically allows you to dive deeper into, you know, the research and kind of what's available out there. You can see on the left here that you can also filter by date and, and you know, that's relevant to where, you know, this corpus essentially includes COVID-19, includes articles on SARS, on MERS, and, you know, both those disease, that information was published, uh, you know, many, many years ago. So you can actually rank results by date and kind of go deeper. Um, but then we also add, you know, some topic analysis as well. So we use, you know, topic-based modeling. So uh, learn, latent Dursley allocation to extract topics from the articles. And then we provide those on the left as well. So it gives you a set, a way of searching also by topics that may be interesting. So, you know, if you are uh, a researcher that cares about genomics or epidemiology, you can actually just filter to articles that are directly talking about that as well. So are there any questions? I know we, we were already started a little bit late, so we don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, but we have like maybe just a few minutes for any questions that people have on either the machine learning that was used or the process, um, you know, the, the challenges, et cetera. There's a couple in the chat here. Let's see if, uh, let's see. There's a few, so let's kind of go through them. So. We have one from uh, Jasmine here, and let's see. Uh, oh, no, that's a different one. Lillian has one. So does this presume that the articles are published online, uh, which is probably a safe assumption for COVID-19, or are we applying it uh, concept to other diseases? So, you know, that's a good question. So in our case, what we're doing is, uh, you know, Allen Institute for, for AI has actually built a way of collating, you know, thousands, these, these thousands of articles that are coming out per day. Um, in their most recent post, uh, they are up, there are over 150,000 articles already, which is also kind of, you know, mind boggling to think about that, 
you know, in real time, you can see how our knowledge on COVID-19, you know, globally is really progressing. You can actually go back, uh, and look at articles that were published uh, right when the outbreak started back in January. There were, you know, maybe a hundred or a couple hundred, very, very limited. And now it's, it's grown right into hundreds of thousands uh, at this point. And so what they do is they kind of collate all that information together. And what we do is we ingest directly from, um, from Kaggle. And George, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think you pretty much nailed it. We're, we're up to 181,000 publications now in this data set. Um, and as Colby already said, this is sourced by the Allen Institute for AI. Um, and we pull directly from that and use that to fuel, um, fuel this uh, Cord19 Explorer. We have like an automated data update system. Right. And so we actually, yeah, we, we automatically update this uh, regularly in line with, uh, you know, as data is published by E2I. So, you know, this is evolving in real time. And as, you know, really cool articles come out, you know, in time, they, they become available through the system. Uh, let's see. Does Kendra operate on text only? Are there plans to expand Kendra to learn from images? So, you know, I don't think we would be the best people to, to kind of address this question. Um, you know, Kendra currently uh, is, is mainly focused on uh, leveraging machine learning and natural language processing to kind of give you this kind of enterprise level search. Um, as, as all things AWS, we're constantly innovating and, and listening to customers and, and really trying to build the products, you know, based on, based on the roadmaps that they have. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I think, I think, you know, definitely look out for really, for more exciting kind of announcements around Kendra. It's, it's seen a, a large adoption already. And then uh, maybe one last question. Um, one, the good one here, how do you give weights to papers? And that's, that's good. That was like part of the, the secret source of how we, um, sort of created this engine. And there's kind of a, a number of different. Uh, ways that we do it. We actually give some choice up to the user. Like for example, um, you saw here that we have the ranking systems, which is basically we weight it on how many citations it has, which in, if you imagine the graph, it's how many edges there are going into it from other papers. Um, you know, how many authors uh, they have and the, the authors are ranked by how prolific they are. So, it, you know, a lot of it is based on a concept called centrality, which is basically in the knowledge graph, how important is a node, which often has to do with how many edges are going in and out of that node. But it's also related to how many edges are going in and out of the nodes attached to that node. So there's kind of like, you know, higher order relations going on. Um, so if you just look up sort of graph algorithms, look up centrality, you can have a good idea um, of the sort of algorithms that we use to, to rank those papers. As for the initial rankings on the site, those come from Amazon Kendra. And so that uses some, you know, built in machine learning that's in the AWS service already. So we kind of um, integrate them together. Um, and give the, the user the ability to kind of tweak what they want, if they want just what Kendra shows or if they want the most citations, authors, et cetera. Awesome, awesome. So in the interest of time, I, I know uh, Kesha has a lot of good things for you guys. You know, I, I think we'll probably uh, end it there. So yeah, Thank that's you. all. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank Thanks, you everyone. so much. That was and you, awesome. And you can go to that URL if you'd like. It's uh, externally facing and uh, explore it yourself. Thank you so much, George and Colby. That was a really cool use case. <laughs> Thanks okay. very much, Kesha. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. See you later. Have fun. Thanks. OK, I hope you all really enjoyed that use case. I think it's really cool just to hear how we can use machine learning to battle COVID. So now I'm going to start with my presentation. So let me share my screen. And then share my slides. Okay. I'm assuming that everyone can see my slides. So this is the second workshop. And we're going to talk about data prep.
And the overall goal, remember, is to really prepare you for this hackathon that's coming up. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to take everything that you've learned and then compete in the hackathon. So the submissions for that are due on the 14th, and then we actually will have live judging on the 19th. And just a reminder about the awesome prizes, one year free membership to a cloud guru, and that's the company that I work for. We have um, online training courses. And then you also receive $5,000 in AWS credits to help you continue to build out whatever solution you submit in the hackathon. So let's talk about data. Now, when we talk about machine learning, I've shared before that data is the most important piece of it. And so I've gone through and I've done a ton of research and Google searching, trying to find data sets that uh, are available that are of good quality that we can actually use to battle COVID. And so I provided this spreadsheet in the Slack channel, but I'm going to walk through it now as well. Okay, so in this PDF, I've listed several sources of data. So for the first one, there's the World Health Organization, and that includes information on new cases, new deaths, and it's all separated um, by country. So have a, have a look at that one. I also found data from the New York Times, um, and it shows the deaths uh, data related deaths um, for all of the, the causes and all of the cases. So take a look at that. And then REARC, I was able to find that and it's through something called the AWS Data Exchange. So within AWS, there are companies that make data sets freely available. And for most of them, you have to subscribe. And for this one, I don't believe there was an approval process, but for a few of them through the data exchange, you actually have to submit why you want access to the data. And for the ones that require access, I just submitted, I'm working on a machine learning hackathon to battle COVID and my request was approved. And so this one here from REARC, it's a series of data files with the counts across the United States at the state and county level. And also on the data exchange, I was able to find this one that shows a state by state pro uh, projection. And it talks about the death counts, um, the bed use in the hospital, ICU use and ventilator use. So that one may prove useful. And then here, another one from REARC, um, it's about the, the beds in the hospital, um, licensed beds, staff beds, et cetera. I found a really neat one from Vertical Knowledge that looks at how the pandemic is affecting the airline industry. There may be some pretty cool use cases that we can come up with with that data. And then Xmode, they have data that analyzes the human movement patterns during the coronavirus and it's on a global level. So that's pretty interesting. And then this one shows chest X-rays that one could prove useful. And then the from Brazil, patient level data, and that's the one that I'm going to show you um, a use case on today. So that just basically shows at a patient level, the laboratory results um, for that person. Uh, let me go back. And then, you can't see it, let me scroll down here at the very bottom. This one shows COVID test, the seven, seven day average, and it's for San Francisco. So that's this link. And then also for San Francisco, the rate of weekly change in the positive hospitalizations. And then here again, same San Francisco, the acute ICU care beds available. And then the new cases per day. And then I actually found data that's broken out by race for COVID uh, results. And then I was able to find COVID data for South Korea, and that's on Kaggle. That's the website that Colby introduced you to. 
And then I was able to find additional data from Johns Hopkins and then data from the UK. So that's a quick look at some of the data sets we have available. So let me go back to my slide deck. So now let's talk about some data preparation techniques. So at a high level, we're going to talk about translating images from black to white, one hot encoding, search and replace, and feature engineering. So for the first example, typically when you're working with these machine learning algorithms and you're using images, they expect the images to be um, black and white. And so you'll have to go through a process of taking the color image and converting it to black and white. And there are libraries in Python that help you do that. Another data conversion or preparation or transformation technique is called one hot encoding. And I briefly mentioned this, I believe, in either my talk or the last workshop. But remember when we're working with these learning algorithms that all of the, the features or the data points or attributes need to be in numeric format. And there are cases where the data that you have is a string. And so how do you represent a string in numeric format? So for example, if you had a feature um, that was represented string red, white, and blue, you'd use this technique called one-hot encoding. And what you would do, you'd create a new column for each unique value. And then the row or observation that's, let's say, red would have a one in that column and then a zero in the white and blue column. So that technique is called one-hot encoding. There's another technique called search and replace, and I use this quite often. And you use it where you have values, string values that can easily be translated to numbers. So for example, in your data set, if you have days of the week, you can use search and replace to replace Sunday with a one, Monday with a two, so on and so forth. And then there's something called feature engineering, and I've used this before in the past, and it's where you actually take one feature or one attribute and you create new features from it. So for all of my programmers out there, they should recognize what this first line is. So it's a date time stamp. And when you look at that date time stamp, a machine can't really find trends and patterns if it's presented with the data in this format. And so you use this technique called feature engineering to take that one feature and split it out to create three new features. So in this example, the date timestamp will be translated to a month, a time of day, and a day of week. And with, with those three new features, uh, the machine can now find trends and patterns across months, across the time of the day, like morning, evening, or night, or even across days of the week. So keep those uh, techniques in mind when you're working with your data in preparation for the hackathon. So I started out this journey um, because I wanted to see if it was possible to use machine learning to battle COVID. And I shared with you all uh, previously that I'm always working on a side project. I'm always trying to learn new things. And so for me, my summer challenge to myself was to use machine learning to battle COVID. And my project is, uh, using laboratory results to see if machine learning can predict a diagnosis. And so I was searching online and I came across this article and it really inspired the example that I'm going to show you today. And specifically, it's going to see if indicators of kidney disease can help predict a COVID-19 outcome. 
So when I read this article, uh, the results found a high relationship between kidney disease and in-hospital death of COVID patients, and that doctors should really increase their awareness of kidney disease as it relates to COVID-19 and the outcomes. So I wanted to see if a model could look at kidney functions to predict outcomes. And I'm no doctor. <laughs> a lot of these medical terms that I'm going to try to pronounce, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing them correctly, but I think it's very important to, um, when we're looking at using machine learning to battle COVID, to really think outside of the box and see how machine learning can help us find new insights in data. So when we talk about looking at kidney function to predict um, a COVID outcome, these are the important features. Um, and some of these features could actually lead to a bad outcome. And so in order to really bring this idea to life, I needed patient level data. And I can't tell you how hard it's been for me to find patient level data. But I was lucky enough to find that one hospital in Brazil that released um, anonymized patient level data. And so that's the data set. Okay, so now based on this article that I read, I see all of the important features as it relates to understanding kidney functions. And so that's what's in this red circle. And remember, I believe it was last, the last time we met, I told you it's very important whenever you're using machine learning to have some level of domain knowledge of the data that you're working with. And so on the left-hand side, I saw that these were the attributes um, that could indicate issues or with your kidney or kidney disease. And so I wanted to learn more about each of them and then try to figure out if those were represented in the data set that I had from Brazil. Okay, and so when I, I Googled these, these, uh, these terms, this is what I came up with. Okay, so for this very first term, this elevated SCR, I'm sure that's short for some long medical term. Um, it's related to the creatinine that shows up on a lab result. And the same thing for this elevated BUN, that it's uh, related to creatinine. And then this third one, this EGFR, I found that that's a value that's actually estimated and it's based on the level of creatinine and I hope I'm pronouncing that word correctly, <laughs> um, age, race, and gender. So it's an estimate. And then this, this next one, protein urea, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it shows the levels of protein in the urine. And then this hematuria shows the presence of red blood cells in the urine. Okay, so now that I have a high level understanding of these important attributes, I wanted to see if those attributes were represented in the data set that I pulled down from the hospital in Brazil. And so in that data set, yes, they have actually two um, attributes that represent creatinine they have um, age, but they did not include race and gender. And then for the protein urea, there are actually two fields in that data set that show the level of protein in the urine. And then for the hematuria, there's actually a field in the data set that shows the presence of um, red blood cells. Now for this last one, kidney injury, I'll really have to reach out to a doctor <laughs> and have a conversation with that person to really understand how that's represented. So for now, I had to leave those as question marks. And then in the data set, there's also this binary variable here that indicates whether or not the person tested positive or negative for COVID-19. So I'm going to quickly show you the data set. Okay. 
So this is the data set that I pulled down from the hospital. And I'll scroll through some of the columns, but I'm not going to go through all of them because there are 111 columns. But this basically shows per patient, their age, their COVID results, whether or not they were admitted to a regular ward, um, the semi-intensive unit, the ICU, and then it shows their lab results. So like I said, there are almost 111 um, attributes here that shows how uh, they tested during the test of, for their lab. So there, like I said, there are 111. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but that's just a look at the data set that we have to work with. So now let me go back to my slides. Okay, and so just like before, there is, I've checked everything in, the data and the Jupyter notebook, I've checked that into GitLab, and this is the link that you can use to actually pull it down and open up the notebook. So now I'm going to walk you through what I have done so far in the notebook. Okay. So at the very top, I'm including the pandas uh, library that gives you access to data frames. We saw that saw that last week. And then again, I'm using matplotlib. We used that last week as well. So then here in cell 157, I'm loading in the CSV file. And then I'm printing out the shape. So here it shows 5,644 patient records, 111 columns. And then here in 159, I'm just showing the first few records. And I will just scroll over a little bit so you can see that. And then here in cell 160, I'm showing just the last few records. Now, the first thing I did here in cell 161, I needed to clean up the column name so that I could actually work with the data. So first, I'm getting rid of the spaces. So for example, here in patient age, there, there are spaces. And so instead of spaces, I used an underscore and then notice here, there are parentheses. I'm replacing the parentheses. And then I'm also converting like the uppercase um, letters in, in the names to lowercase. For me, it just makes it easier to read and easier to work with. And so this is the ending result here. And so now, for example, the P um, in patient is lowercase. The space is replaced with an underscore. And then down here, I'm just showing the, the features, like these, the important features from that article. Then I'm showing here the column name that it maps to in my data set. And then here I just have a description. And in this case, I decided to leave age in, just in case we can find um, patterns or trends across age. And then I also left in this, I told you about this, it's the exam result, positive or negative. Okay, and so what I did here in 163, I dropped the columns, so the, the lab results that really don't indicate issues with your kidney. And so I dropped all of those results, those columns from the uh, data frame. And it basically leaves me with what's shown here in 164. So the age, the COVID result, and then those important features or attributes that indicate issues with your kidney. And then I show the last five records. And then here in cell 166, I'm checking for null values. If you noticed when we looked at the Excel spreadsheet and even the data printing out the data frame, there are a lot of empty records, unfortunately. And so this just shows me a count by these important fields. 
And so here I made a decision to drop all of the records with the null creatinine, just looking at the, um, the, the important features. It seems like creatinine really um, is really important and it really plays into determining how well your kidney is functioning. And so I just decided to drop the records that didn't have creatinine. And so that leaves me with 424 records. Ideally, I would want way more than that, but this is just a proof of concept. Um, if anybody out there has a good relationship with hospitals that would be willing to give us anonymous data, that would be great. So here in uh, cell 169, I'm replacing the NANs or the nulls with zero um, because remember everything has to be a number. And so I'm just printing that out and we see the zeros now instead of NAN. Okay, and then here, now that I have the, I guess the, that data with the different features that I'm going to use, I'm running here what's called a correlation matrix. And what that does, it shows you the relationship between the features. So for example, in what we would expect to see when we have this correlation graph is this yellow line starting here from the top left going down to the bottom right. And what this is showing that there are no correlated columns, which is a good thing. So for example, in this row here that shows creatinine, let's say underneath this urine red blood cells, this cell was yellow. That would show that creatinine and the urine red blood cells that they are related. And so potentially this, this could be duplicate data or, um, data that we don't really need. So if, if there's a high correlation, then we should consider removing one. And that just really makes the machine learning process faster and the model better at inferring the meaning in, in these attributes. So uh, the correlations look good. And then here in cell 172, this is just showing the numeric uh, value for the correlation. And then here I'm looking at the data types. So for example, here for this exam result, notice it's a, a negative and that's a string value. And so I'm going to have to convert that using one of the techniques that we discussed to um, a numeric number. And that's what I'm doing here in cell 174. So basically this is saying any place you see positive change it to a one. Any place you see negative, change it to a zero. And now here we see in this cell, we'll see either a zero or a one. And then here I'm checking for null values. And then here in cell 177, when I was going through the process of just analyzing the data set, I noticed that in this urine protein field here, they actually, some, some of the records actually had a string value absent. And so that needs to be replaced um, with a zero. So here I'm just printing it out, but then here in cell 178, I'm basically saying anywhere you see absent, replace it with a zero. And then here, I'm just checking to make sure that there are no more records that have um, the word absent. And then here in cell 180, I'm just printing out one observation. Again, just to double, double check. I, I, you'll find with me, I like to check and double check <laughs> and check again. I don't know what it is about my personality, but yeah. And then here in cell 181, I'm checking the class distribution. And so here I wanted to understand more about the data. So how many true cases or positive COVID results do I have? And then how many 
negative cases. So in this case, in this uh, data set, the, there's 14% for true and 85% for false. And when I think about the distribution, I mean, it's okay, but ideally I feel like I would need um, additional true cases. And so there are some things that I can do to even out the data set. Um, ideally, I would want additional true records from the hospital to really make this um, as powerful as possible. Then once you have your data, you've gone through this process to get it ready for machine learning, you split the data. And sometimes people will do a 70-30 split. Sometimes people will do an 80-20 split. But essentially what that means, you have, your, you have 100 records. And so you'll take 70 of them. And that's what the learning algorithm will study to produce the model. And then it will cover the training process um, in deep detail next week. But during training, models are produced and they're evaluated. So how are those models evaluated? It's with the remaining 30% of, of uh, data because now the model has access to be able to test itself to see how good it is at predicting a certain result. And so here I'm using scikit-learn and that's what we'll use um, next week for training as well. And I think I gave you guys that as homework to read up on scikit-learn. But scikit-learn comes with a function that will quickly and easily split the data based on whatever um, parameters you provide. And so there in cell 182, I'm splitting the data set. And then in cell 183, I'm checking <laughs> to make sure that it, it actually split correctly. And it shows here uh, just about 70 and 30. And so that's it. Now, I have not run this data through um, the training process yet. I will do that um, before next week. But I do want to show you, let me go back to my slides. Next week, we'll talk about training. And I'll use this the same example, but we'll look, we'll look at some learning algorithms. We'll look at naive Bayes, random forests, and logistic regression as a part of training and producing this model. And so, like always, I'm giving you guys homework. And so for homework, you can just read up on these learning algorithms on the scikit-learn website. And that is all I have. So now we have data, we've gone through and we've prepared it. And so next week we'll talk about training. So yay, we have actually have time for questions today. So let me look at the chat. Uh, 54 new messages. It looks like folks have been asking some things in the chat and then also some folks have been trying to answer some of them as we go along. So, <laughs> Okay, awesome. I appreciate the help. Let's see. Now I also see Q&A. Yeah. There's, all right, let's see. Yeah. Okay, we have one here from Lamisha that says, um, can I participate if I don't know how to code or any, any of this I want to learn? Um, yeah, of course. We welcome new people um, to all of our workshops and events. So if you don't know how to code, that's completely fine. You can learn. We're all here to help each other. Yes, I would agree with that. And with um, there's one example that I showed, I think it was last week, using image classification all through the SageMaker um, interface. In that example, you don't, there's no like Jupyter Notebook or Python code. You don't need to know how to code to do that. Um, you just need to understand the image classification learning algorithm 
and all of the different hyperparameters and how you set those through the SageMaker console. So it's definitely possible for you to generate a machine learning model and participate in the hackathon without knowing how to code. And then we have another one here from Liz and um, she said, can you share more about what is meant by proof of concept? Okay. So proof of concept is, is an idea where you're, you're building a, an application, or in this case, you're training a model, and it's really just to prove out the possibility of, of what you're trying to prove. So for example, in this case, I have limited data, patient level data from Brazil. But let's say we train this model and it's really good at predicting COVID outcomes. So now you can say, hey, I have this proof of concept. It's not really meant to be used in a real world scenario, but it proves that we can look at laboratory results to predict COVID outcomes. Now we have this, we take it to like a major hospital somewhere, I don't know. And we work with them to get more data to actually build a real system that can be used in the real world. Okay. Somebody said <laughs> my pronunciations of all those medical terms was very entertaining. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. <laughs> okay. So patients, oh, health professionals also look at dehydration. Nice. That's good to know. Kidney injury is related to some type of trauma to the organ and can be due to, to disease, medical intervention. Okay, that's good information. Are we going to receive the slides later? Yes, I will post the slides in our Slack group. All right, somebody shared a document from health professionals about testing explanations. Cool, I'll take a look at that. Yeah, we have another one here in the Q&A um, panel um, by Katherine. She asked, um, when, do, when doing EDA, but I have a data set with a lot of categorical data and only one numeric data column, is it worth doing? Yes. Um, for academic purposes? Yeah, I think so. If you can convert, if you can, there are several um, techniques that you can use to convert like string or categorical data to um, numbers. And I only went over one that I'm familiar with called one hot encoding, but there are several um, different ways that you can take those strings and represent them as as numbers. So I, I definitely think it's it's worth worth a try. Should you shuffle, I see the question, should you shuffle the data before splitting? Yeah, yeah, that's good practice. And I believe Scikit-Learn has an option for doing that, to shuffle the data. Um, well, we only have five more minutes. Sapphire, I know you need to wrap things up. How are we on time? We have five more minutes left. So I'll start wrapping up now, right? and if anyone has any questions for Keisha, um, please do join our um, Slack, uh, Data Science Slack, and join the ML Social Good channel, and Keisha's in there, and you can ask questions. Any more questions you have for her in there? I'll just send the link in here again, in case anyone has. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending and I'll, I'll follow up with the answers in the Slack group. Thank you so much, Keisha. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. There we go. Can everyone see my screen okay? See it, Keisha? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, 
as Keisha mentioned a lot through um, her workshop today, there's going to be um, a hackathon. Um, so you can register for interest um, at this link here. And it's also been posted in the chat as well. And this Saturday, we have um, an introduction to NLP uh, workshop starting. Um, you can join at womanico.com forward slash data science forward slash events. And we have a six, it's going to be running for six weeks. And then Keisha's next workshop, the last workshop of the series is going to be next Wednesday. And you can register at the, the same link I said there as well, um, womenico.com forward slash data science forward slash events. And this is our social media pages. Uh, if you would like to email us or have any questions, please email myself or Naomi or email data science at womenico.com. And this is our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages. And that is us today. So thank you everyone for joining and a big thank you again, Keisha, for your workshop today. I hope everyone has a great day. And like we said, if you have any questions for Keisha or any of the women or any of the data science women who team, just please reach out to us. Um, I'll stop sharing. Sorry. Okay. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you.